So yeah, the the configuration of the uh, for each one of the applications, we're doing a lot of research. We have, um, the, as I mentioned prior to Paul coming up, there are some applications that we're we're focused on primarily for cloud applications currently, um, Aerospike, Redis, Memcache, Nginx being the, the primary ones that we're working with right now. Um, there are others uh, we actually, as I mentioned, with um, at the Storage Developers Conference last week, um, MVME over TCP using ADQ. Um, came up with about the same uh, performance as our RDMA, both Rocky and, and iWarp performance. So we're really seeing the ability to um, use the combination of these uh, different aspects together in order to drive the the, the traffic. Um, just on the, all the text on the on the right hand side here, back in April, this is what uh, the quote that we got from Aerospike um, that they were excited about the possibilities. And then this is the press release that they came out with uh, just last week um, when they announced their their 4.7 support with the um, the. 75% increase. So we are working towards, you know, being able to extend this out. And as Paul said, understanding how to set up the queues and what makes sense, what you know, what doesn't for the individual applications. This, you know, this it's like QoS and and security. How much do you do? It's how much you need. You know, if you get to a level of performance that you that you're happy with, great. You know, but sometimes you just need to keep tuning and tuning until you get you know, to where you find the, you know, where the diminishing returns on, on the improvements. So there is a lot of opportunity. We are working towards building this into orchestrators and, and deployment engines and stuff, but it's going to take time based on and working with the different um, ISVs to enable their applications and then as people get used to using the, the, the full suite of tools. I'm just trying to connect the dots on this. So is uh, modifying the application the only way to use ADQ no. on the Intel NICs, or is there your yeah, so modify the device driver if you just want a standard ADQ across all your servers? The, the, one, um, the, the one reason why with, with Aerospec is it's a multi-threaded application. Um, for single-threaded applications like um, Redis Open Source, and where that is a much easier scenario with that application because you have multiple instances of the application, they all have their own uh, destination port, and you can direct traffic right into that. There isn't the whole NAPI ID of uh, you know add. Now it is only ten lines, but as Paul said, it's understanding how to take advantage of that in the application or in that system in that cluster to take full advantage of it. So. Part of it, it was easy to enable, um, which you know we've done ten lines of code in some of these, and, and for the multi-threaded applications, and seen improvements. But also the work to make sure that we're setting up the under, you know, the, the infrastructure underneath of it um, to take advantage of it. Yeah. To be clear, the the device drivers changes are done, right? The dri the, the changes are in in the code to configure the hardware the way that we want to do that to enable all these features. Um, that long list of kernel enabling stuff that I was listing is all the user space hooks to enable the configuration of the driver so that you can configure the hardware, right? You can get step at a time all the way through the layers. Um, so I just wanted to, to point out those device driver changes because you mentioned them mm -hmm. are, are ready. Okay. Um, and yeah, the, uh, first, the first phase of it, yep. um, as, as we mentioned before, we want to be able to extend it to other protocols and other support other than what TC Flower currently can um, right. filter the traffic into the queues. But um, it's... Just a quick question. If, if, if your app isn't NUMA node capable, mm -hmm. in terms of you run it a dual, dual core, dual socket configuration, and you don't have any sort of optimization around that because you're not making use of a virtualization platform to do that for you, you're not going to see a benefit out of this. Currently, um, we're currently we're focused on the bare metal, and right. we have other technologies like VMDQ and VMDQ. so forth right. for um, for the virtualized environment because mm -hmm. that's a whole another right. I'm just thinking. another whole piece there. Right. Um, so we have similar technologies for for that. Yeah, for uh, single-threaded apps, though. Yeah, you should. 
it, you'll get a, you can get a benefit from like 80% of the technologies that ADQ makes up, right? Even right. if you don't implement the NAPI ID piece. Well, so, you, you, actually, you don't need to in that case. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it, I'm just thinking there's a lot of people who are trying to do like Kubernetes on bare metal, you know, that's continuous. It is things. it is one of our areas that we're we're right. developing and, a, So yeah, cuz you got a problem there with with like Numa node affinity for like application runtimes, right? So that is the area that we're working on right. how to how to balance I just want to make sure I wasn't mixed up. Yeah, no. Around. You're right no, on. All right. No. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's um as as Jesse mentioned, you know, there's a, there's a suite of 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 technologies Getting them to work in all the different environments, that's really what the ADQ uh, technology is about, is enabling those. And you'll see those um, getting enabled um, as we work out some of the challenges. Um, but it, it's pretty impressive what for the areas that we've been able to do right off, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit, it's very impressive um, performance improvements. So should we do a quick uh, overview of DDP here yeah. and wrap it up. <laughs> yeah, so um, as I mentioned with, with dynamic device personalization, um, with our 700 series, we were able to surgically insert a, a, another protocol definition into the parse graph. We didn't have a lot of room left because of how the, the parts are architected, but with, with the 800 series, it, we were able to change that. So just, you know, when we start looking at what are all the different uh, protocols that are, you know that are possible to add into the parse graph? You know, we we do have a limited amount of protocols that we can support at any given time. So, how do we bring those in? Also, when you add protocols into a def into the default set of, of protocols, we have to maintain those and keep them that way forever. So, if a protocol changes, if it gets updated. That becomes very challenging because if people are using the old one, we, and, or the, the old definition, the driver may or may not understand. You know, it may not work the same way. The application may expect something, and if we change it under the covers, that's bad. So we really are trying to figure out how how to provide the breadth of protocol support that we need for a, a wide range of application or um, deployments. So this is just an example. You can see there, you know, just just on the on uh, the broadband network gateway. Can I just ask you a quick question? Yeah. So I mean, so since you're talking about this in the in uh, the context of Ethernet and NICs, I'm assuming you guys see all of these devices eventually going towards more like an x86 based approach. Is that what you're saying? NFB or? has. I mean, that's the goal. Are we there? Some cases, yes. Some cases, no. I mean, you know, it's yeah. I mean, because like t today, a lot of these functions are on like hardcore dedicated, yeah. dedicated ASIC but, but type that's, boxes. But that's definitely stuff. changing. So like, Edge yeah. has got got white box OLTs that are open. Yeah. They've got open I, slams. I see it like uh, there's a place for some of these things. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I think I, it's gonna be a long. I, we're time not. Yeah. We see. It is a long. Yeah. Yeah. I fully agree. Yeah. And in some cases, you know, I, I've talked, you know, years ago at IDF, I had some comms providers come up and say, hey. We want to move. I'm like, take your time. I yeah, want my yeah. cell phone to work. But I'm yeah. pretty sure AT&T's already got an OLT yes. that's x86 based. Because <laughs> yeah. I've been reading about their cord deployments. Yes. And I'm almost positive that's in prod. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. That's a good point. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so, um, and also as 5G, and, and I heard earlier, you know, some new protocols and new definitions, that's what we want to be able to set up. And so what we've done with the 800 series is that we have a default set of protocols that, um, that are typically found in, in most networks, right? I mean, you know, the, the NVO3 uh, tunnels, so NVGRE, Genev, VXLAN, and VXLAN GPE, those will all be there by default. Those aren't necessarily changing much, um, and we can handle that. We'll have the ability to load a different package at runtime, and I'll go over this, with additional pack, or protocols that we're referring to as this enhanced DDP package or, or a segment specific. So the first one we'll do we'll have, that will be available in, in the DPDK 1911 release will be available to add GTP and PPPoE. These are the two, first two protocols that we added with DDP on the 700 series. So we're basically having a parity uh, with those um, initial um, protocols. And then we'll have 
additional releases that will add additional capabilities. Um, and I couldn't put the actual titles up there, but you can kind of see where the target segment is. So based on the protocols I've seen you put out here and the use cases and the network architectures that you've put out here, you have a lot of mobile providers pushing you for this technology. Yes. And yes, we do. In order to fill out all those different virtual environments that used to be um, yeah. appliances, yes. So these, and, and because there's changes, and also some of the stuff that would be like in a 5G environment may not be needed in these other environments, so you actually don't need them and you may not want them, right? We want to keep these things as simple as possible, but you know, we have, have to, um, to find a balance between it. Because what happened, or what we can do, is we have a very minimal set that's shipped with the, the NIC itself, so that's a pre-boot environment. I call it safe mode. I think standard VGA, it works, but it's not there for performance. It's just to get us into the pre-boot and to have a known good state to fall back to um, on the hardware. Then it will, the driver will load the default profile, that first one, um, if you don't tell it to load a different one. So you can, on a per device basis, identify with a serial ID, say, I want you to load this package on this device. So in the same system, you can have five adapters and all have different profiles on it. So you can use it as a gateway router uh, scenario with different profiles, or they can all be the same. You can deploy it um, throughout the, through the device. Um, and then there's opportunities to um, modify it, as we were talking about earlier, with changing your input sets and so forth. So the next one is just the animation. To emphasize this, we have the safe mode um, that ships by default on the adapter, and then you have the ability to specify which protocol, I mean, which package you want on any specific device in the system. Yeah, and to connect things up, the packages we're talking about here are the things that define those field vectors that we saw at the very beginning, right? right. The way that we define those tables um, of filters that are used by the hardware parser to, to do all the uh, assignment and flow rule lookup. Because the preload that you want in the access layer in the last mile is going to be different than what you want in yes, core. Exactly, in exactly. And so you guys are pre-building these as templates so that you can reuse the same chip architecture at all these different delivery points in the network. Same adapter. Right. So same I adapter. Pa we passed around that. Same software. Yeah. So, same it's software. The same, so it's the same NIC. We're taking same the same NIC, NIC yeah. using it in the core, yep. and using it out yeah. in the last. So that eight, the, the, the dual 100 gig cool. adapter, you can set that up as actually an 8x10, 4x25, 2x50. It's that same adapter. The user can define it as a multi multiple different connection types and use different pro, um, uh, packages for those different environments. So it really is to, you know, for the comms service providers, it does provide uh, a lot of flexibility with having to only validate one adapter. And this just summarizes, we need it, the information in the parse graph and that it then enables us to do things like ADQ and um, the stuff that we do with TPDK. So in summary, those are the two main. I never can make it to the rest of it, so I actually moved to the, the, the rest of it. The presentation has some additional information about being able to configure the, uh, that the QSFP ports into multiple different um, connection types, and then um, a slide on our summary for um, what we showed at the Storage Developers Conference. Right, the RDMA stuff. The RDMA.